Nomads are pioneers. They've always expanded the boundaries of knowledge, of experience, and space. We at Beyond Gravity see ourselves in this tradition. Building on a 40-year heritage, we've been involved in European space missions ever since the first endeavors. And we've always overcome the boundaries. The boundaries between European and American partners. We have uh, many years of partnership. Between continents. The boundaries of our atmosphere. The boundaries of what is technically possible. Pushing boundaries is a mindset. You need to be passionate, curious, and have the will to innovate, to build equipment for orbit, set sight beyond the horizon, and help us face our challenges on Earth. We have a down-to-earth attitude. Meticulous planning. Reliability. And a rigorous testing regime are mission critical. To do this, we need real craftsmanship, as well as comprehensive engineering skills that allow us to think decades ahead into the future to advance humankind and enable the exploration of the world and beyond. Our final panel today, Mission Success is a team sport at NASA, features an impressive lineup of NASA associates. To lead this discussion, we are pleased to welcome Associate Administrator Jim Free. Mr. Free, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Captain Schaefer. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, thank you for being here on behalf of the Administrator and the Deputy Administrator. It's a great honor to be up here with my, uh, my colleagues from NASA to, to talk about a, a variety of topics. Um, I do want to thank the Space Foundation for this opportunity and uh, Danielle Gervalis, who was uh, really essential at putting this together. So thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, let, me, let me start with some introductions of the, of the panelists here today. I'm first going to start with Kathy Kerner. Kathy is the Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development, uh, which is all of the, uh, the Artemis missions. Uh, next, Dr. Nikki Fox. Nikki is the Associate Administrator for our Science Mission Directorate. I'm sure she'll highlight the, the vast variety of uh, missions that, that SMD is responsible for. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Kurt Spuds Vogel. Uh, Spuds is the Associate Minister for Space Technology Mission Directorate. And then uh, Captain, Navy Captain retired Ken Bowersox um, is the Associate Administrator for Space Operations, uh, ISS. Uh, as an example, commercial LEO destinations as another. I'm sure Ken will uh, talk about that. Uh, Finally, not here today is the, uh, our Associate Administrator, Bob Pierce, for our Aeronautics Research Mission Director, um, Mission Directorate. And uh, Aero actually does play a role in space. They take care of a lot of facilities that we use for our missions, and they also are responsible for a number of uh, the foundational tools we use uh, to do our missions. And the last member of this panel is Bob Gibbs. Bob is the Associate Administrator for the Mission Support Directorate. And I have to tell you that I, I've been waiting a year for this moment. <laughs> um, a, a year ago, Bob played a joke on me uh, while we were up on stage uh, on this panel. 
And for a long time, I've been thinking about how to exact revenge on him and coming up with very, what I think, probably you don't, are funny statements. And then about two weeks ago, I realized that the angst he had about what I was going to do here was far more fun than anything I could make up. So I've just been building up, even in the green room, what I was going to say about him today. And I'm really not going to say anything because that the past two weeks have been my enjoyment. So <laughs> I'd like to issue my first grievance. <laughs> we'll just start here and we'll work. Uh, can we mute that mic, please? OK. Um, <laughs> So let's see, we have a, a variety of topics to talk about today, and I'll, uh, I'll ask some of the mission directors to start and welcome others to, uh, to uh, participate. But uh, yesterday, our deputy administrator, Pam Melroy, announced our space sustainability strategy. And uh, you heard the, the phrase in there, it's going to take a whole of agency, definitely from us, obviously other participants as well, but a whole of agency approach to tackle the issue. and. All the mission directorates have some connectivity across space sustainability from our missions, some of which I highlighted, from the technology we developed to help uh, predict and, and avoid collisions, some of which Pam talked, an uh, example of which Pam talked about, talking about how we characterize the debris environment, how we support all of that effort. That all spans the mission directorate you see up here. So let me start with the first question. How will you support the agency's responsibilities in space sustainability, and what projects are you looking forward to collaborating on that enhance the space sustainability operations? Let me start with Nikki first. Hey, yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, so I, I, I want to start by sort of riffing off the, the whole of agency and the, the NASA, you know, that what a team sport NASA is by just um, just taking a moment to say that everybody. I hope everyone had a chance to enjoy the eclipse on Monday. Um, yeah, um, and and you know what a tremendous success it was, and that it was actually due to the fact that the whole agency came together to uh, to share that. Um, and uh, some, you know, we had 12.3 million people um, was our highest hit on the the website. Um, 4.6 million people on the Spanish website, um, and my favorite one was 165,000 people using the Spotify playlist for the eclipse. So, um, but you know, it really was. We had over 400 NASA staff from all across the agency um, staffing up and, and sharing the joy. And and so I, you know, I just wanted to to start off by by saying what thank you. Thank you to the agency and thank you to the community. I hope everyone, even if you were here, you had a chance to step outside and just enjoy the majesty and beauty of our own star. So coming off the eclipse, the science team um, is really excited to be uh, joining in with the sustainability strategy. And, and we, you know, we feel we have a very um, important role in it. We've been working towards solutions um, to many of the challenges that are contained in the strategy uh, for, for some time. And most of our missions um, contribute directly to several of the goals. Um, you know, for one, for one, we're always looking at how we can collaborate better uh, with our many different partners and stakeholders. Um, and you know, we, we sort of we look at large language models. Uh, we're working to improve efficiency and consistency of uh, you know our data stewardship um, and streamlining operations across all of our activities. We're leading, we hope that we're leading by example um, and establishing responsible norms in um, how we use cutting edge technologies. So one of the things that we're very committed to is responsible AI use and we work very closely with the professional societies and the wider community to ensure that um, everyone is taking this, uh, this same approach. We have collaborations with professional bodies uh, such as the American Geophysical Union um, and uh, they've been pivotal in uniting our broader community in these goals. Um, uh, uh, open science is a very big thing for us um, in, uh, in SMD. Uh, 2023 was the year of open science, and so we use that to kind of kick off and educate the community into the importance of open science for sustaining the use of, of our data. Um, just last week, um, I'll say that uh, NASA released um, the catalog for our OSIRIS-REx um, samples. We're really excited that uh, we released the largest, um, the largest asteroid sample ever collected uh, from Bennu uh, with uh, 121.6 grams of material. And uh, we did release that um, catalog uh, detailing all of the things, uh, demonstrating how we're working with a very increased network of, of collaborators. 
Orbital debris is a very big thing for us. Um, we are looking at it, at it in all scales um, as it's present in the space environment. It can certainly impact all kinds of uh, objects in space, including critical infrastructure and, of course, our human explorers. And so as we move um, beyond uh, low Earth orbit to cislunar, really figuring out how we're going to be protecting um, our explorers. Uh, we have information from the NASA science missions, which is, which is really invaluable in understanding and mitigating the hazards that are posed by orbital debris. Um, and in, in addition, uh, you know, we, we have to worry about um, the, you know, the, the uh, debris caused by collisions, so sort of orbital debris causing yet more orbital debris. Um, SMD supports the, uh, the detection uh, technology development um, and combined with a very strong R&D component. Um, in the heliophysics division, the space weather programs, orbital debris, and space situational awareness efforts address a knowledge gap um, by focusing on orbital objects of, of uh, natural and non-natural sources. Um, and uh, we, we sort of typically focus on things that are below three centimeters in size all the way down to <coughs> nanometer sized dust. Uh, we, uh, we are also um, supporting uh, the, um, the NASA uh, Johnson Space Center Orbital Debris Detector Instrument uh, that's going to be flying on a JAXA mission. And uh, we're also working with the DOD Space, space Test Program to fly um, a light sheet uh, instrument, again, to bring more sort of looking at different ways to measure debris. Um, we do take very seriously lowering the boundaries um, to sustainability by developing and transferring technologies in partnership with our other directorates here, uh, with our U.S. government partners, international partners, and academia, uh, you know, to sort of make sure that we're really serving a global science community. In uh, the Biological and Physical Sciences Division, they have a huge portfolio of work, uh, much of it aimed at uh, reducing mass for future human missions by refining and advancing the technology. Uh, we have innovative models like uh, 3D tissue chips, something I'm really excited about, 3D tissue chips, that enable researchers to um, uh, really study how a patient might respond to a treatment uh, without the need for um, patient, uh, the patient to actually receive it directly, so improving um, our, our testing of, uh, of medications. And that, of course, will help us to tailor supplies like medical kits to individual astronauts uh, so we only fly what we need on these long-duration missions. Uh, in Earth science, uh, they, of course, are the preeminent team characterizing our planet's environment, bringing home uh, an incredible amount of, of information. Um, they're the lead for uh, the U.S. Greenhouse Gas Center, of course, partnered with EPA, uh, NIST, NOAA, to really uh, establish a hub for a collaboration between agencies across the U.S. government and, of course, our nonprofit and uh, private sector partners. And that's data, information, and computer models all being shared. And science experts from each of these federal agencies uh, get together to curate a catalog of greenhouse gases um, and, uh, and making sure that they are sharing those uh, with everybody that needs them. Um, obviously, you, I'm sure you followed along uh, as we uh, d landed our first uh, commercial lunar landing. Um, it was uh, uh, executed by our industry partners, Intuitive Machines, that delivering science to uh, the these moon's uh, South Pole region. And it's a great example of how we are working with our partners uh, to, again, lower the boundaries to access space. Planetary Science uh, also worked recently to, develop, uh, to select the first science instruments that are going to be designed for astronauts to deploy on the surface of the moon during Artemis III. So we're really excited about that. Um, so, you know, I think and in, the, uh, in the Science Mission Directorate, everything we do is very much interconnected. Um, our discoveries and our technolog technological um, innovations building off one another to really keep the sustainability of what we do, uh, pushing, the, pushing the limits of what we know is possible. Um, at any given moment, we have about 140 uh, missions, all of them, um, you know, providing really key information uh, to, to work towards um, our sustainability. So NASA science is everywhere, and we deliver every minute of every day of every year. Thanks. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, let's talk for a second about when we uh, put together missions, and sometimes we, we make choices that maybe aren't aligned with space sustainability and uh, to, in order to, to maximize what we can get out of the mission from a dollar perspective or 
uh, from a science perspective or from a human spaceflight perspective. We do things that maybe minimize our cost but have an impact on what, we, what we're talking about now from space sustainability. What strategies will you all deploy to kind of avoid that clash between short and long term? Let's start with Ken. Well, um, in space operations, we're responsible for human spaceflight missions in low Earth orbit. Um, and we have uh, support roles in all of our directorate missions uh, in communications, launch services, and human research. Um, when we look at the risks in low Earth orbit today, um, the orbital debris risk is one of our highest for um, the, the space station and crews on orbit. Um, we'd like to see that in the future it's, that's not the case. We'd like to see the environment changed so that we can um, uh, have new programs instead of having so much risk that we have to stop operating with humans in uh, low Earth orbit. I think we're a long way from that, but it's not something that's impossible if we don't take steps now to think about the future. So I think that's something that, that we'll be looking for in all of our uh, developments, all of all, all of our proposals uh, in the future, is not that they're just thinking about cost and schedule for, for what we're gonna do with that particular mission, but also thinking uh, long-term about the effects on other missions. And, and one of the things that excites me the most is the, the technologies that we may develop when we have that attitude towards our missions uh, and, and the types of things we could do to make the environment better. Thanks, Ken. Kathy, you have any thoughts? I do. Uh, so in exploration systems development, sustainability is really a foundational tenet to everything that we do, all of our exploration activities. In fact, um, it's what's required for safe and successful mission execution from um, orbital debris that you've heard um, both uh, Nikki and Ken talk about, all the way to non-interference in the cislunar environment, both in orbit, but then also on the surface. So it's extremely important to us. And making sure that we are all talking and communicating and participating and have that strong interaction with all of our partners, both our industry partners, as well as our international partners when we're creating those missions, will help ensure that we have that dialogue and we're building on the lessons from previous missions as we move forward into future missions. Thanks, Kathy. Let's shift away now for a second uh, and, and talk about where NASA's heading for the long term. We, we've been working for uh, almost a year, I guess next month will be a year, uh, that we've been had this focus on NASA 2040, which is how are we going to change our operating model going forward to change how we do business how we take care of our infrastructure, how we develop technology, how we take care of our most important asset, our workforce. And um, I, I'd like to hear what, what are your mission directorates doing to sustain our skilled, diverse workforce for uh, between now and the decades to come all the way through 2040? Let's start with Bob. So I think when you were looking at 2040, for me the shorthand is a critical examination of what you're doing and how you're doing it looking for opportunities to improve, looking to make sure that what you're doing can be balanced in the long term. Regardless of mission, we can answer the call and do those things and do those things successfully. What makes it a little challenging, and I think, you know, we talked a little bit about short term, long term earlier in the question, um, is the environment we're in right now with limited resources, increasing requirements and increasing costs. It makes everything harder. We all have to do this on a regular basis is trying to make those trade-offs. I think what we have to do as leaders as we're going through these things is make some of the harder decisions to invest in the long term, even if it's painful, to make sure that you built that foundation, right? For us, it's a question of foundation and fires. Are we building the foundation for success of NASA as we go forward? And are we able to respond to crisis as they occur often in the year of execution, the week of execution, the day of execution, whatever those things might be? When you're talking about sustainability for us, Workforce, infrastructure, and technology are our principles. <clears throat> we have to make sure that we maintain a competitive advantage in talent. It's what makes NASA different and special. We have to make sure we have the people needed, necessary, trained, and ready to carry out the mission, do the things that we are so honored to do uh, for the nation and for the international community as well. For infrastructure, <clears throat> I apologize. Um, for infrastructure, we have to make sure we have a sustainable portfolio, something we can afford as we go forward, which gets us into another opportunity, right? One of the things we're looking at below workforce infrastructure and technology is how do we make it easier for folks to do business with NASA as we go forward? 
How do we lower some of those barriers? How are we a better partner? That is one of our goals in 24, and all of the leadership you'll hear, flavors of that from everyone up here. But I will tell you, I think it's one of those things, as we talk about 2040, it's not a date, it's a, it's, it's a process, right? But as we talk about those things and being uncertain as to what the mission may be, we have to be able to successfully complete it and work through all of these problems together as a team, again, as a team sport. Thanks, Bob. Spud, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, Jim, uh, so I'd say for Space Tech, uh, it, it, it comes in the form of uh, how we're adapting to the environment. When Space Tech started, it was created and organized by technology readiness level. And what we are doing in the last couple of months, we've talked about a couple adjustments we want to make in, in Space Tech, and one of them is how we're organized. So what we're going to do now is we're going to be organized more in functional domains. And this gives folks an, an opportunity uh, to uh, stay with a technology from, from early idea con concepts all the way into the, the later parts of the, the tech base, you know, TRL 6, 7, and shepherd that along the way instead of having to hand it off in between within the, with, uh, in, inside the tech base. So that gives us an opportunity, and it's a, not, it's a reminder that just like our mission adapts and has to adjust, we want to do the same thing with our, with our folks. We want to make sure that they're able to adapt and adjust and stay flexible to the mission. Thanks, Buds. So let's move to the next topic and talk about the Moon to Mars architecture a little bit. And, and uh, I think many of you, I hope, are familiar with it. If, if you're not, uh, please please uh, look at our website and, and look at the Moon to Mars architecture. But what it does is it defines elements that are needed to achieve our long-term uh, human-led uh, scientific discovery of deep space, those exploration goals. And it distills down a set of objectives, which you can also find on our, our website, which have uh, evolved over the years here, uh, announced right here on this stage actually, into the operational capabilities we need to achieve the science, which is central to our exploration, and the human goals that we have to explore deep uh, into the solar system. Talk for a minute about how that process really empowers all of you to help define and contribute to the blueprint for exploration to the moon and beyond. And let's start with Kathy. Thanks, Tim. Um, so you mentioned the objectives. When we rolled out those objectives, we actually had bucketed those objectives into four categories that roughly align with the four technical mission directorates that you see up here. So operations, science, infrastructure, and then transportation and habitation. So each of the mission directors here had actually a responsibility for some of those exploration objectives that we then took and converted into and continue to convert into architectural elements. As we have gone through our architecture development process, which is shepherded by the Strategy and Architecture Office within Exploration and, and championed by our um, DAA for Strategy and Architecture, Nijud Brancy, who I think is in the audience here, um, we take that, use that process, and all of these mission directors are heavily involved in the development of that architecture. So they, for example, um, this, the technology mission directorate provides the technology that is then in, um, infused into the architecture over years as those mature we can include those in the different elements that are part of the architecture going forward. The operations are key to what we are going to be executing both in the Sisler environment but then on the surface. Science is foundational to the activities that we're going to be doing both in orbit but also on the surface and it's really the reason we go and explore. So it really is I, Pam said it, a whole of agency approach to how we're going to be exploring. Thanks. Nikki, you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, we're, we're really excited to be supporting the Moon to Mars um, uh, architecture. And as Kathy said, we really do feel that science is foundational, science enabling exploration, exploration enabling science. But really excited about uh, the uh, picking the geology team to, I know they've already gone down and been training with the astronauts, which is super exciting, picking the tools that we'll, we'll take um, with Artemis III and are, you know, starting with the clips landers of starting to put more science and more technology on the moon to, to really enable that sustained presence. Um, so, we, yeah, I mean, we are so excited about it. Nikki lines the human spaceflight folks up like me and says, okay, science is important. I science do. is, she makes us practice all the time. Every morning. <laughs> yes. Um, let, let, me, let me go uh, kind of off the questions here for a moment just to throw you. What, what's one thing you've seen change 
in the agency since we have the objectives, the moon to Mars architecture, the integration across the mission directorates, and I'll let anybody start that wants to start with that. So if I, if, if I can start, Jim. Sure. Um, so what I have seen dramatically change is really the interaction between our mission directorates and that we're all now aligned um, towards a common set of goals and objectives, both near term as well as long term for our exploration of the moon and beyond. I'd like to piggyback as well. I think one thing that uh, uh, I've noticed external looking out uh, at the folks outside the agency, there is a, because you know, one of our goals that we've been after was resilience with this. And you see people, I keep using the phrase, people you know, having their hand hovering over the I believe button. When we first stepped out on this, it was one of those, okay, let's see this play out. And so what we've been doing for the last year and a half uh, Jim, actually led by you, uh, th this was this is something that now they've seen us. We've had two ACRs, we've had two of those cycles, and people are now hitting the I believe button. They actually see it, and, they, and that helps us with the resilience, and it's happening with folks outside the agency as well. I think that's really strong. Let's, anybody? Go ahead, Ken. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that um, we've uh, been getting so much positive feedback on the whole effort that we're going to try to do something similar for our work in low Earth orbit to, to really try to um, uh, get the input from all the different stakeholders on what's important in LEO, why we want to be there, and why we want to continue working there in the future. I think there's also like a, a, there's a shared energy. I mean, there's a different energy in, in the agency. Um, and, and that feeling that we are all, we have one shared goal, and that is to go to the moon and then to Mars. And, and it's really exciting to have that, that it, it is, it's just an energy that's, it, that's yeah. around the whole thing. For us, it's working across organizational boundaries and being able to identify those things we need in the workforce, unique infrastructure, technology to accomplish the mission. And it recenters everyone on it and reminds Absolutely. us all why we're here. We are here to accomplish the mission. Mission supports only, only job. No, one, two, three, and four is to support the mission. That's it. That's what we're here to do, and that really helped focus us. It really did. That's and inspiring the next generation. I mean, I love the Artemis generation, and uh, that, that it, it is about inspiring people. Great. Thank you. Let's keep talking about the Moon to Mars architecture for a second, and let's talk about partnerships. We, we have a, a lot of partnerships across Artemis. Um, uh, partnerships are certainly nothing new to, to NASA. We fly the International Space Station uh, every day in uh, international partnerships. We have, I don't even, can't even imagine how many agreements in the science side to fly things. I certainly know what's in Artemis. I know there's a huge infrastructure to support the partnerships in the mission support director, directorate. So how do we make sure the partnerships that we have align with what we want to do, our strategic goals? You know, how, how we integrate those, how we, how we trade those. We obviously get pressure, pressure to have some partnerships, make sure we have still the partnerships with industry, with academia. Um, let's talk about that for a second. I'm going to call on a couple of you, but let me start with Kathy. So having that architecture that is a whole of agency approach to how we're doing exploration helps us align our discussion with our, our partners, both our industry, academia, and international partners on what we're trying to accomplish as we execute Artemis. Artemis as a brand has a lot of strength behind it because of that and because of the fact that we're making very visible progress as we move forward. So having that um, collaboration with all of those different entities, making that foundational to what we're trying to accomplish because quite frankly, our architecture is so ambitious, we know we cannot do it by ourselves. It cannot be just a NASA thing. It cannot be just a United States thing. It really is something that we're trying to broaden and do for the first time, right? Exploration as a civilization and include as many partners as we can that want to peacefully explore with us. Spuds, you have thoughts? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that we, there's a couple of pivots we're going through in space tech. Uh, I mentioned the organization's one of them. Another one is the way we set our priorities. And so if you look at, uh, as an exemplar, what's going on with Moon to Mars, uh, they're, when our, my, all of my principal customers, tech base for civil space, most of them are sitting right here. Um, they're, they're my principal stakeholders, they're our customers for that technology. So what is going on on the dimension of human exploration and in some part uh, science, because it's a derivative part of Moon to Mars, um, as you architect from the right and you're following back where Kathy and her team leaves off on the architecture and gets to element initiation for the big things, 
that sets the table for us to, to figure out how do we have to set our priorities. And one of the ways we're, do, one of the ways we're mechanizing how to set our priorities is by engaging with our, the broader stakeholder group, not just the, the mission directorates here, other government agencies in civil space, industry, academia, that we want to engage with them. And just now, this is sort of, I'm taking the opportunity, if you don't mind, Jim, to say today we, re we are releasing a, um, a, a shortfalls list. We've consolidated, taken a first stab at what will be an annual review of the shortfalls for civil space. There's 187 of them that we've leveled out. And we're looking for feedback on where you see those and scoring them and how you, how you see them as far as the impactfulness from your perspective. We're gonna take that data and we're gonna be very transparent and show you what that looks like uh, about in uh, like late May, early June. And we'll show everybody that. That will then feed and be, be a tool for us to start to create that audit trail of how we prioritize what we're doing because we never have enough dollars to solve all those problems at once, so we have to prioritize them. And the way we do that is by engaging with the stakeholders, and that's really an extension of what is already going on with Moon to Mars architecture on the human exploration side, with the decadal process on the science side. We're just extrapolating that as we keep coming left from that uh, architecting from the right. So, Bob, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's over 2,000 active partnerships right now in the agency in many, many places, many, many structures, many, many forms. And if you look at 2040 and what it's trying to do, I think there's an undeniable truth within it, and that is wherever we go in the future, we're gonna have to work better with those outside our fence line, with industry, academia, other partners. We have to find a way to make these partnerships easier to understand, easier to use, and make sure that we're doing a good job of opening the front door, which 2040 is working very hard on, so people can see where there's opportunity in infrastructure or mission or other things. So I think there's a lot of opportunity as we go through these things. You know, it's, it just says a lot about the agency that, you know, we're, we're taking these steps to, again, examine what we're doing and why we're doing it. Nikki, you have thoughts? I mean, obviously, we have an unbelievable number of partnerships in the space, um, uh, the Science Mission Directorate, with 140-some missions. You know we've got it. We, we have partnerships with everyone. Um, but I think the key is really um, open communication and being very transparent. And, you know, if you can find shared goals, it's so easy to work together. And as long as you get those goals out at the beginning, it does make that much easier. So I think so with the things like the Moon to Mars strategy, where those goals are out there and they're out there for everybody to share. And, you know, um, though I do hate giving credit to you, Jim, um, I do think you did a great job. Um, I know. <laughs> um, you did a great job at like involving um, industry, commercial, international, very early on before we even rolled out the the, the, the real strategy. So I think it was mostly Kathy, but uh. there's a lot more people that I credit. <laughs> I'm waiting for Bob to release my shortfalls list. So. <laughs> Ken, uh, you know, I, I had the pleasure to uh, spend some time with Ken uh, recently, seeing our International Space Station partnership up close. And Ken, talk about it from your perspective, because I, I walked away with such admiration for you and Joel Montabano, the ISS team, the folks at JSC that make that cooperation work. Well, what's amazing when you work with partners is how much more you can do together. Um, but it's really important to realize that there's extra work required to make a partnership work. You know, people talk about what it uh, requires to make a marriage work or what it requires to make a business partnership work. Um, international partnerships, commercial partnerships, um, you have to do more than just um, focus on the work you're doing. You also need to focus on your relationship and keeping that relationship moving. And sometimes you do things that are better for the partner than are better for you. And you do it on purpose, right? And you work together to get to the end goal. And when that partnership is successful, you know it because things grow and, and uh, it doesn't require a lot of assessment. You can see it. You can see things take off. Thanks, Ken. So let's, let's talk about the next topic. Um, a lot of what we have to do is really preserve, certainly we're the beneficiary of a lot of work that's been done over the years on a variety of programs in this agency. And how do we capture those lessons learned? How do we, um, and the hard fought really lessons, how do we capture those? How do we share those? How do we in, uh, ensure we're not gonna make the same mistakes? Or we, we know, hey, going down this path uh, is not successful or really highlight these things. Ken talked a little bit about a couple attributes there. 
Um, like, give me your thoughts on that. Spud, do you want to start? So yeah, it's a, it's a piggyback a little bit on the previous answer as well. That, that shortfalls list that we're coming out with, it's a, because it's an annual thing, we can actually grade ourselves along the way and see how we're doing. We can track and say, hey, is this a problem that we absolutely need to solve or haven't been solving? Uh, and track that over time. Does, how does that move up and down that priorities list? And let's say, for example, if, um, if something starts really high and everyone agrees that this is something we have to tackle, and then it start, slowly starts to work its way down, that means one of two things. Either the mission has adjusted, or we were successful in knocking down the risk and knocking down the technology readiness level of those things. So maybe we, we can declare victory in some of these cases. Conversely, if we have one that starts really low, and, I, and I'm gonna go back to the very first question you asked about uh, the space debris as an example. Since all of us were, in, you know, started our space careers, which for Nikki and Kathy was just last year, because they were very young. Um, no. Uh, but that's that's been a problem forever. It's a long long haul problem and a short, and it's right in our face right now. We know as 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 the environment has changed, we have to solve this problem. So let's say that ranked, and it's one of the shortfalls. Let's say that ranks really low. It means we're not communicating it well, even amongst ourselves, and saying, hey, do we really identify that this is a problem? So we can track that. And so there's a gauge that we're gonna use in space tech to see how are these problems manifesting from year to year. And it gives us an idea to add or subtract things as, accordingly. Thanks. Kathy, you have anything to add? Though? So we build on the heritage of human spaceflight, decades worth of heritage of human spaceflight, as we have been establishing Artemis um, we have a very extensive lessons learned process that we've taken from there, and we executed that for Artemis One. In fact, because of some of the lessons we learned from Artemis One, we uh, announced in January of this year that we were going to delay Artemis Two so that we could make sure we incorporated the lessons from Artemis One into the Artemis Two mission. So as we execute these missions, and they all build on each other from one to the next, um, that helps make sure that we are capitalizing on the lessons from the previous mission as we execute the next mission. Um, one of the other things that, that we're doing really is also kind of along the lines of what Spud's talked about is we do an annual review for our, our architecture. So as we're learning things, as we're uh, new technologies are an, on ramping, but also as we're executing these missions and we're learning from these missions, we can adjust what we're doing with our architecture and we can adjust what we're doing with our missions. Thanks. Anybody else have thoughts they want to add to that? Yeah, certainly in the science side, I mean, we, we do a tremendous amount of looking at what, 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 do you, what did you learn from the last mission, how are you going to apply it to the next one, um, and we do that with each of our missions, so I feel like, you know, we build on all of the, the, uh, the, the legacy missions. Um, you know, I could highlight Habitable Worlds Observatory as something that is, is you know, building on everything that we've done before. So. Uh, it's going to be a spacecraft the size of Webb using the um, wavelengths of Hubble with a coronagraph like we'll fly on Nancy Grace Roman and put it all together. But we're also doing the tech development and maturation program before we even start the mission. That's a big lesson learned from when we did our large mission studies. And I just have to quote Wanda Peters in that we don't just do lessons learned, we do lessons applied all the time. I think part of this is also how you share information, right? And I'll, I'll give Nikki's group a lot of credit. You know, it isn't just understanding those legacy issues. They were able to share 54 enormous data sets across the world last year from what we learned. And so it isn't just protecting that information and making sure we have it and we've learned and applied those lessons. It's sharing that information for the benefit of all. Okay, thanks. Um, what, what we've, let me shift it, and none of them have this question, by the way, which is kind of fun for me. What's the best quality of the person to your left, Bob? I'm just, I, um, <laughs> what bill of grievance two? That would be a very we, short we've had a lot of discussions uh, in, in 2040, for example, of how, how, do we, how do we bring people that always say, how do we work with NASA? It starts at a at outside the gates of one of our centers. It starts at a, a company that might have an idea, and, and anybody can jump in. What, what's your best advice of how how to find that way into the agency from each of your mission director perspectives? I think it's hard. I think right now it's hard. It's why we're looking at the front door to make those opportunities easier for folks to get. Maybe establishing a metric that they can get to the right person within a certain period of time, 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it might be. But being able to get through those things, because we are really eager to have those partnerships to work collaboratively with industry, with academia, with others. 
But I think we have to take some steps and understand where we are not necessarily measuring up and find those ways to put the information. I think there's a lot of technology that could solve these things. Wouldn't it be great if the, our partners could see the available infrastructure we have that's in excess of our needs on a real-time, regular basis, saying, geez, you know, I'd love to go into a partnership with NASA, and that's a very unique facility that I could use and leverage. And that door swings both ways. We'd have to look across the way and say, we really shouldn't build this facility because it's here and here and here domestically or internationally. So I think there's lots there. Other thoughts? Go ahead, Ken. I was going to say, uh, for someone looking to collaborate with NASA, they shouldn't wait for us to make it perfect, right? Start with somebody you know, somebody you meet at a conference. Um, I, I get uh, inquiries a lot uh, that are not in my directorate, but I always try to find somebody else that might be interested in and try to find a place for that person to go. So just because we may not have the perfect way for, for people to get into NASA, don't stop. Keep, ask, keep, ask, keep asking us, and we'll find a place for you. Tim, oh, okay. yeah, go ahead. So nasa.gov slash architecture, you'll find a link there. Oh. It has an email that allows people to be able to reach out and ask questions about the architecture. <coughs> and that is monitored, and we can send you to the right person who can help you um, get connected with whatever part of the architecture you're interested in. In space tech, there's a number of mechanisms that we have for engaging with us for a, a lot of these technologies, all the way down from uh, early stage type things with SIVRs to uh, tipping points, ACOs, flight opportunities and whatnot. And one of the pieces of feet, and it's new to me, I've been in the job for about two months, and what I will tell you, what has been obvious, what has stood out to me, is that there is a hunger for those things, and that we, they, the, the frequency that we're doing them, we, have to, we actually want to take a look at and see, maybe we should provide more of those opportunities and, and adapt the frequency. It was good feedback for us, even in the, some of the meetings we've had since being here, of, maybe look at the, the, the rate at which we're doing uh, these activities, that we should probably turn up the gain on some of those, especially the ones that are more successful, and there's a lot of them uh, out there. So we're listening to you as well. Let's try to provide more opportunity for you to come talk to us and share your ideas and look for those public-private partnerships. Great. And I think if all of that fails. So there's always an opportunity to reach out to individuals within the agency. Last year I made a small tactical error, and I gave out <laughs> Jim's email address. You probably shouldn't do that if he's going to become your boss. So this year, I'd like to apologize from the bottom of my heart. I, and it was really you that Mike put me up to it. You know, I just want to make sure that we're clear about that. I didn't want to do it. And she said, "You got to do it." And I said, "Okay, I'll do it." But you know, I could give you a cell phone number right now. <laughs> that any time, 24 hours a day, seven days. Just want to talk late at night. Give me a call at this number. I better not. Next Let's question. Next question. Next question. <laughs> I can't wait for Bob's performance review. Oh, it's good. You and me both. Um, let's see. We have just over five minutes left, and uh, for the for the five of you, in in I'll say forty seconds each, what what would message would you want to send about the of NASA today? So I'll start. Um, I think right now we're really at a pivotal point in the agency where there is so much activity and so much going on, both in low Earth orbit, but ultimately um, also with our plans to go to the moon and beyond with all the science activities happening. There's just a, we're really at, a, at a, I'll say, a tipping point. We are the Artemis generation, and this is a time when we can really determine the future of the agency and that um, future at least from my perspective, looks very bright despite the lights in front of me. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say. I'll pivot off that and, and say, I was because I was going to say an inflection point. We used to say that with the Moon to Mars thing yep. is we are an inflection point as, as a community in the ecosystem uh, for this, and, and there's opportunity there. And so just from my selfish corner of the world and the space tech side of things, what we to maintain resilience, I think the message to, to say is that we are, so you understand where we're going, is we're pivoting away from uh, directly prioritizing things based on the solution space and looking at those, those shortfalls and then washing the solutions, the things you bring to us, the ideas that we come up with on our own against those shortfalls so we can maximize the value that value proposition back to the back to the taxpayer, and I think that when you keep that in mind, that's what helps us be resilient uh, over the long haul for this this these goals that we have in front of us. Go ahead, Sox. Yeah, 30 years ago, all I wanted to do is work for NASA. If I was a young person today, I'd want to work at NASA. Um, the past is great, but the future is even brighter. Go ahead, Nikki. I have to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, uh, I, I would say that, you know, I mean, Moon to Mars is, is fabulous. NASA science goes from the very center of the sun to the very edge of the universe, um, peering back into the very beginning of, of the universe. We go to every planet, uh, we fly helicopters, we fly octocopters, we do all kinds of very exciting stuff that really does inspire. Um, when we talk about sustainability, it really is a, a big part of that is, is inspiring the next generation. Um, I, I agree with Ken, 30 years ago I wanted to work for NASA and I still do, um, <laughs> and um, even though Jim may not have made other plans for me. But um, it, it, it's such an inspiring thing to do and, and we deliver literally every second of every day of every year amazing, amazing science um, that inspires the world. I, for me, I think the work is incredibly important, incredibly meaningful. I think the mission has international importance. And we're, we're better to work right now at this time in this agency as we're trying to figure out some of the hardest problems facing us. It's, it's a great opportunity. So I think from a lot of the speakers that you've seen uh, over the past few days, there's a lot of call to action. Certainly our deputy administrator uh, gave one. I think others have as well. I think you, you have to figure out how do you digest that call to action. Um, you've heard some of that here today from this group. Um, it's, it's really on you. We, we, this is our job. We're privileged enough to do it. What are you doing to answer the call to action? What are you doing to, to, to make a difference either in science or in some other form, human exploration, whatever it might be, what are you doing in the time that you're spending here to turn that into some kind of action? Um, I, I, I want to make sure that you know the five folks here, and imagine Bob Pierce from Aeronautics right here. These are incredible leaders in space. When you see them walking around, please stop them, talk to them. Um, they enjoy the conversation. They, they are passionate. Every one of them are passionate about what they do, and I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity when you see them. Thank you again for being here today, and enjoy the rest of the symposium.